All right. Hi, Pam Rikansky here, uh, YES uh, facilitator for here at the North Suburban YMCA. It's a pleasure to welcome once again uh, Matt Margolis talking to us today about navigating the long-term care maze, um, the hidden costs and pit and potential pitfalls of long-term care. Uh, uh, we will be um, da, 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 da. okay. Um, with that, I would just like to welcome Matt today. Welcome, everyone. Hello. Good morning. Um, good to see everybody's faces. This is one of the most well-attended ones I think we've had in a while, so that is awesome. Um, and it's nice that some of you guys are letting me see your faces because it always it always makes me feel better when I'm actually talking to what I feel are real people versus just names. Names are fine. I see a couple familiar names and saw some familiar faces before they did, decided not to share their screens. Um, so yeah, just you know, a, a minute of background on me. Uh, my partner, Lauren Weldon, and I have um, sort of what I refer to as a boutique elder law and estate planning practice in downtown Park Ridge, even though I'm a Northbrook resident and live uh, basically, uh, you know, walking distance from the YMCA. Um, when we help all sorts of people with, with their planning needs, we do powers of attorney documents for 18 year olds going off to college, and we do planning for folks in their triple digits that just need powers of attorney or trusts or wills or whatever they need and kind of everything in between. Um, uh, we double, uh, you know, as a state planning and elder law practice. So we do have a strong focus on, on working with seniors and making sure that, you know, we're, we're looking at their planning. We kind of look at their planning through a certain lens. Similarly, we also help in situations where folks are, you know, all starting to need care and they're bringing caregivers into the home or going into assisted living or nursing homes. And we can kind of help navigate um, certain benefits, certain benefits that we can help them with, certain benefits that we can't, but we have, um, you know, colleagues of ours that, that, that are very helpful. So we, we try to be, uh, we try to take a pretty holistic approach uh, in the sense that if we can't, if we can't help, we definitely have people that can. So um, that's me, that's us. And today we're going to be talking about the long-term care maze. So you know, my agenda to give everybody a heads up, you know, I'm going to, and, and 45 minutes to 50 minutes is, you know, sometimes it's, it's more than enough time. Sometimes it's not, um, you know, there's a lot of information I want to cover. I'm going to try to keep it concise because uh, I think it might be helpful to have some time at the end for some questions. Um, I think that this, this topic especially really leads itself uh, to some questions and, and I'd love to, to have some time at the end for that. So um, I'm going to try to give you as much information as I can but hopefully not overwhelm you. And there are gonna be things that I'm not gonna cover um, and that's fine. Um, I will put my email in the chat box for anybody uh, that, you know, you're free to reach out to me after. You can always shoot me an email, you can call my office. I do not do these talks to get business. If business comes, great, fine, wonderful. But this is truly just me trying to get some information out and um, so if there's, if there's follow-up questions that anybody has, you know, uh, as long as it's not a, a novel, you're not email, emailing me a novel, um, I'm happy to shoot you a quick response. So, um, and I would say if you can hold your questions to the end or put them in the chat box for all of you that are um, technologically savvy as, uh, in, in, um, and understand how that chat box works, feel free to throw them in there. Um, you know, or write your questions down and ask them at the end. If you're like me, you know, if you don't, if you don't write it down or ask right away, you're going to forget. So use that chat box for that. Um, or just write it down and then you can ask me at the end. Uh, it's just easier if I don't get kind of uh, bogged down with questions during, during the conversation. So, um, so today we're going to talk about types of, types of long-term care communities, um, certain types of benefits that, that we can apply for, um, depending on, the long-term care community that we're in, um, or even benefits that we can apply for if we're, if we're living in our own home and we need long-term care. Um, and as well as maybe some, I'm gonna say strategies, but really just some just some considerations, frankly. Um, you know, when it comes to, you know, being in that stage of life where all of a sudden, you know, we're needing, we're needing to think about bringing caregivers into the home or going into some sort of long-term care community, right? So, um, all right, well, let's talk about the different types of communities that are out there. Um, so we kind of look at the communities in stages, right? And, and some of you might be familiar with these, but you know, I'd say, you know, if we kind of start with 
you know, the idea that when we start to see a need for care, let's not even get into the idea of a community. I'd say the first, the first place that people tend to receive care, and I'm sure most of you would agree, would be in their home, right? It might be a very, very limited amount of care. Maybe it's just a spouse that's starting to help out, um, you know, their husband or wife who's starting to maybe um, slip a little bit, whether it's physically or, or, or cognitively. Um, maybe it's an adult child that's living in the home or maybe not living in the home, but, but visiting the home to help, to help their mom or dad um, with some issues that they're having. And so we tend to see sort of that, that first level of care, if you will, is sort of at home. Um, I would also argue most people I meet with, I've been doing this for 12 years, most clients I meet with, if presented with the option of being cared for in their own home versus being cared for in some kind of community, most people would say their own home. Um, you know, obviously there's some people that like the idea of a community. You know, they, they, they're they around more people. Uh, it gives them the, the chance, the opportunity to be more social. And so there are some benefits of, of the community as well. Um, but if we kind of graduate outside of, of, of needing care in the home, then we're sort of looking at, you know, a few different settings outside the house. And um, one setting that's outside the house that doesn't necessarily mean we need care. It just means that maybe our 4,000 square foot home is too big, right? We don't need it anymore. It's too much to maintain. It's silly to keep on paying for landscaping and, and snow removal and all of those things. And we just don't need the space that we needed 30 years ago when we were raising a family. And so some, in some cases, we're not moving out of the house because we need care, we're moving out of the house because it's just not the right fit anymore. And so we'll see clients go into independent living. And independent living does not mean we need care. Again, I wanna be really clear here. Um, independent living, I kind of look at it, it's like a senior dorm, right? You went, some of you went to dorms in, in college when you were in college. Now the room, these rooms are, these rooms tend to be a little bit nicer in the independent living facilities than your dorm room was back in college. but. It's sort of that same concept, right? You know, you're, you, it's almost the feel of a condo to some extent, but with you having zero maintenance outside of your own room, right? You've got your own living situation. You're still able to care for yourself. And really the idea of, a, of independent living is you don't have to maintain that big house anymore. You don't have to pay for all those unnecessary expenses that you really just weren't taking advantage of as you once were. Similarly, again, there's sort of this um, socialization aspect, obviously, to independent living, right? I've got a lot of clients that start to feel isolated in their home, especially if they lose a loved, especially if they lose their spouse. But it's not just for the widows or the widowers. It's the couples that maybe they've started to lose some of their friends. Maybe their friends have been moving to Florida. They don't have as many, their, their social group has kind of dwindled for whatever reason. So going into independent living is not just the idea of downsizing their big house they don't need, but it's also from a socialization standpoint, now they've got more people that are really close to them. They don't need to travel to see. They can have they can visit with them and play games during the day. They can have people to have dinner and breakfast with various activities. Again, so some people might just look at independent living as a sort of a next step to get out of the house. Now, as we start to need care, you can be in independent living and still have a caregiver. So if we are in independent living and we start to um, decline, again, physically or, or cognitively, we can bring caregivers into an independent living facility. Most independent living facilities will allow that. Um, but if the care that we require becomes a little bit too much, some independent living facilities, they won't allow that, that a caregiver to be there, like to sleep over. You know, for example, if you need if you need round the clock care, some places will allow that. Some places don't. So if we start to need more care, then really the, the next level of care that we're looking at is likely either assisted living or supportive living. And assisted living and supportive living are very a very very similar level of care. Um, I would argue most of you have probably heard the phrase assisted living. I think assisted living kind of gets tossed around all the time. Sometimes people are referring, they're actually referring to a nursing home, but it's, or they're, 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 they're calling a nursing home an assisted living facility, or they're calling an independent living facility assisted living. It's just because to me, I feel like assisted living is like that phrase that everybody uses, no matter what type of facility it actually is. But assisted living would be that, you know, somebody needs help with some activities of daily living, not all, not all activities of daily living, but they might need help 
you know, uh, with somebody standing outside the shower to make sure that they're safe in there. Maybe they need help getting dressed. Maybe they help and they need help with somebody. They can't, they can feed themselves, but they can't prepare their own meals. Um, you know, so they're, so in assisted living, again, I don't need help with all activities of daily living, but I can't do everything on my own. Um, assisted living is gonna be 100% private pay. Let me also go back to independent living. That will be 100% private pay, meaning we're paying for that out of pocket. You might be using your social security, you might be using your pension, you might be pulling money out of your IRA or your brokerage account. Uh, you might have a long-term care insurance policy that's gonna help pay for the assisted living. But those two types of places, any place called assisted living, whether it's straight assisted living, whether it's um, assisted living memory care, because there's some assisted living facilities that specialize in memory care. And then any place that's called independent living, these are all gonna be private pay, okay? You're going to use your own dollars. There are no, um, uh, you, you cannot get Medicaid to cover these types of living situations. Okay, now supportive living. Supportive living is a little bit different. And I would argue that maybe some of you have heard of supportive living, but not all of you. And that's because not every, I, I can tell you that not most people don't know about supportive living. Um, unless typically, unless they've had a loved one in a supportive living facility. Supportive living is going to be a very similar level of care to assisted living. Okay, again, it's sort of between independent, being able to do everything on your own, and skilled nursing, which we'll get to next, which is where you need quite a bit of care. Again, supportive living and, and assisted living kind of fall right in between those two. But supportive living facilities, all supportive living facilities in Illinois take Medicaid. So any place, any facility that's under the umbrella of supportive living, they accept Medicaid. All right, and this is just, this is just really good to know. There are not enough supportive living facilities out there. Um, you know, unfortunately, over the years, we've had a lot of clients that have really been forced into going into a skilled nursing facility simply because they had no money and they had to apply for Medicaid. And there were just weren't enough, there weren't any openings in the supportive living facilities that were somewhat close to where they wanted to be. Um, I know right now, I believe they're still kind of using the term moratorium. Um, or, 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 or standstill on uh, supportive living facilities being opened up. So right now we're at a point where Illinois is not allowing any more to be, to be opened. Um, we're hoping that changes in, in, the, in the nearer future. Um, again, there's a lot of people that kind of fall into that gap of they need some care, but not, not an extreme level of care like skilled nursing, but they don't have enough money to pay for assisted living. Okay, so there really is a strong need for supportive living. And then really that last, that, that, that last level of care um, is skilled nursing. And you can, there, there are skilled nursing facilities, there are skilled nursing facilities that specialize in memory care. Um, I would argue most skilled nursing facilities, uh, and when I say most, probably 90% plus skilled nursing facilities that have any kind of specialization in memory care are going to be private pay outside of skilled nursing facilities that specialize in memory care, there are plenty that take Medicaid. Um, there are more, and it's probably just because most of our clients are, that come to see us end up in, in places that take Medicaid than, than not. But, um, so I'm, I'm not, I guess I'll, I'm not gonna make the statement that I was gonna make, but I'll say there are plenty of nursing homes in, within a five to 10 mile radius of, of the YMCA here that take Medicaid. And I would argue that there's probably more that take Medicaid than don't. Don't quote me on that, but I'm going to say that it's probably over 50%. I'm not going to go down the path of, of you know, are, are places that take Medicaid nice or not nice. But what I will say is that, you know, I think people would be surprised um, at some of the places that, that do take Medicaid. I think, I think Medicaid, like a Medicaid nursing home has a very negative connotation. Um, you know, and, and if, if anybody has driven up and down Sheridan Road on the north side of the city over there by Jarvis, um, it's just one of the cross streets I can think of, there's a couple of nursing homes right there. And if you've driven by there in the summer, you know, these are nursing homes where you see people, and I can remember this as a kid, 
you know, kind of outside in their wheelchairs on oxygen, slouched over, smoking cigarettes, not really looking like they're being cared for too well. And I think that a lot of people have this connotation that these are, this is what all nursing homes are like. Um, and it's really not. Okay, yes, there are some that are better than others. That is for sure. Um, but I can tell you that when it comes to nursing homes and when it comes to looking at a nursing home for your loved one, and this is, listen, we don't specialize in this. We don't, when clients ask us what's a good nursing home or not, we're not the best person to answer. And that's because while we work with a lot of clients in nursing homes, we don't always hear the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, typically, we only hear things that are bad, right? It's like you see more, more negative Yelp reviews than positive reviews, right? Because people that have negative experiences are a lot more interested in talking about it than those that have really great experiences, right? Because we feel like we should have a great experience, so we don't talk about it, right? Because that's what we expect. So, you know, we hear bad things here and there, but that's going to happen everywhere, okay? The nicest nursing home with the greatest staff is going to slip. Somebody's going to make a mistake. Nobody's perfect. Um, but what I tell clients all the time is don't be fooled by the nursing home that has marble countertops and mahogany armoires, because that place might have a really terrible level of care. Whereas the place next door that might not look as pretty and might not look as shiny, the level of care there might be great. It might be far better. So don't get fixated on what the place looks like. I'm not gonna say that some places that look nicer are gonna be, might be better than others. They might be, but you've gotta go into these places. You've gotta look around. And in some cases it, it, it makes, makes good sense to hire an advocate and have somebody give you some guidance and spend a little bit of money and talk to somebody and have them say, you know what, based on what you're looking for, I think these places might be the best fit. You know, maybe you're looking for a place that serves kosher meals. Maybe you're looking for a place that has, um, you know, a Catholic, more of a Catholic background and, and you can go, you can attend mass. Maybe you're looking for a place where there's a lot more Russian speaking individuals. Um, maybe you're looking for a place that has really good care and it might not be, might not look like the shiniest tool in the shed. Um, these advocates that are out there, they're the ones that are placing individuals in these nursing homes on a daily basis. So they know at any given time what places are, are nicer and better and, and have, have staff that does a better job than others. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to stop talking about it right there because I could keep on coming going on and on about it. But again, these are things to consider. And, you know, I always tell people, you know, think about when you were looking at, you know, daycares for your kids or babysitters for your kids. You likely, I would hope, took time in thinking about who's going to watch your infant, who's going to be spending time with your two-year-old. This should be no different when we're looking at who's going to be taking care of your my elderly husband, my elderly mother or father or grandmother. Okay. Um, we're talking about two very vulnerable segments of the population, whether they're young or they're old. Um, so it makes time take makes sense to put the time and effort into figuring out what the best um, what the best option is because it's definitely not a one size fits all. Okay. Now, when we talk about, let's talk about benefits, you know, some benefits that are available depending on the, the living situation that we might find ourselves in. And I'm gonna kind of go back and, and kind of go back to the situation of where we're being cared for at home. So if we're being cared for at home, there are a few different things that we can consider. One thing that we can do, and this might sound silly, but one thing that we can do and I'm gonna, let, me, let me preface this. I meet with a lot of clients where you know, I'm meeting with mom and dad and they need some help and their adult daughter is caring for them. And in some cases, maybe that adult daughter never really left the house and she's always lived with them. Uh, maybe she did leave the house, she started a family, but now she's spending a lot of her time, her kids are grown up, she's spending a lot of time now helping her parents. And you've got a lot of adult adults, a lot of, a lot of seniors that, you know, appreciate the help, but they're like, I really want to help support my daughter. You know, she's putting her life on hold. She just left her career to help us. Um, or even if she didn't leave her career, she's caring for us. 
And I meet with a lot of folks that have this idea of they want to they want to pass something on. They want to leave money to their kids or grandkids. I mean, it's not common that I meet with uh, a senior client who doesn't have some desire to leave some sort of legacy to their kids or grandkids. And I don't care if it's $100 or $100,000. Okay. And so in these situations, I've had clients say, you know, my daughter's taking care of me 24 seven. What can we do? And I say, well, you can actually put a, you can put a, you can put a contract in place with your daughter. I know this sounds crazy to you. Your daughter can actually be a paid caregiver. Because at some point, what if you run out of your money and you need to apply for Medicaid in a nursing home and you're not able to leave your daughter anything because you've spent all your money on, on, on the nursing home? Well, this is twofold. Your daughter's already taking care of you. You can actually pay an adult child or grandchild or niece or nephew, anybody other than a spouse. Okay, you can't pay your husband or wife. Sorry. But any other relative, if they're caring for you, you can pay them just like you would pay a caregiver, some caregiving company to come in. You gotta make sure there's a contract in place though, okay? Because if you ever apply for Medicaid down the road and we'll get into Medicaid, we're not gonna go into tons of detail on Medicaid today. Uh, it's just, I, I, I give another talk where I go into a lot more detail on Medicaid. So I, I advise, I would, I would uh, kind of push you to, to, to maybe consider attending that talk or maybe looking at one that's been pre-recorded. But you know, if, we, if we're applying for Medicaid at some point, Medicaid has certain rules and we'll kind of get into it, but let me just tell you, please take my word for it. If you're going to have a, a, an adult child or anybody, anybody, I don't care if it's an adult child or grandchild or niece or nephew or just a private caregiver. Maybe it's just some woman or man that you're hiring because they are less expensive than hiring a company. And a lot of caregiving companies are pretty expensive now. It's worth it, in my opinion, because they're licensed, they're bonded, they're insured. Um, if they're sick one day, you'll get a replacement. So I definitely would say that if you can afford it, the private care, the, the caregiving companies make sense. But I also understand that it comes down to money. Private caregiving companies are, are I think, are at $30 minimum an hour at this point. Most of them, I think, are between $30 and $35 an hour. So if we're paying a private caregiver, please make sure there's a contract in place. You got to have a contract. Um, I would advise you to work with an attorney to put the contract together just so it's got all the right language in it, but there should be something in writing that, that, that you are paying this person to care for you. And we'll talk about it. If we can get into it on the Medicaid side, I'll explain why, but highly advise a contract in place, especially if it's a family member. Um, another benefit that we can get at home is something called the CCP, the Community Care Program. So I'm not gonna go into tons of details on this. You can, you can look this up, all right? It's the Community Care Program. It's run through the Department of Aging. It's called, a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's known as a Medicaid waiver program. And this is something where if, if a, um, I believe it's a, if a single individual or married couple needs care in their home, and you can own a home, but your total assets have to be less than $17,500. So between all your IRAs and 401ks and checking accounts and savings accounts and everything you have, if it's less than 17,500, you can look into this CCP, Community Care Program. Um, it's not something that you need an attorney to help you with. You got all, had many clients over the years navigated on their own. And what basically happens is the state comes out, they send somebody to the house, they do a, they basically do an assessment and they give you a, they give the person that needs care, uh, what they call a DON score, a determination of need score. And they basically determine how much care does this person need? How much care are we as the state willing to provide them? And they might say you're entitled to 10 hours a week or 30 hours a week or 40 hours a week. And then ultimately they contract with some various caregiving companies that you can work with to get a caregiver in the home. And this will be covered by the state of Illinois. Okay, so just something good to consider. I won't go into any more detail on it. Um, I can't, because I can't really see everybody, um, I'll be, I'm gonna be very brief on this. I'm going to just presume that somebody on the call is either a veteran or their spouse is a veteran or their spouse was a veteran. 
And so I'll talk about the VA. There's a, there's a particular VA benefit, which I'll discuss for briefly. Um, and if anybody has any question on this, I can, you can shoot me an email and I can email you like a, an FAQ, right? Like a frequently asked questions on this that will give you a little bit more detailed information. But there's a benefit through the VA. It's called aid and attendance. Aid, A-I-D, aid and attendance. And we can, uh, if a veteran served during a period of wartime, and really, for the most part, we're looking at, we've still got some World War II veterans or, or surviving spouses of World War II veterans, because this is available to not just a, the veteran him or herself, but their spouse, even if the veteran is alive, but the spouse is the one that needs care. It's also available to the surviving spouse of a veteran, as long as there was no divorce in between. Divorce cuts off the ability to access this benefit. Okay. Um, and so the aid and attendance benefit is one where, here's the gist of it. And again, I'll be brief, but if you want any more further information, shoot me an email, I'll send it over to you. You needed, the veteran needed to serve during a period of wartime. I'm not gonna get into the dates, but we're looking at World War II, Korea, Vietnam. And there are very particular dates that the VA says that these wars occurred, okay? You didn't need to be fighting overseas. You could have been, you could have been here training at you know, one of the bases, as long as you were active duty and not just in the reserves. Okay, so you had to be active duty. And you needed one day during wartime with at least 90 consecutive days of service. So you could have been active duty the last day of, of Korea, the Korean War, and then you served another 89, at least another 89 days after that, and you would qualify. So first we look at, did you meet the service requirement? Then we look at assets, okay? To get the VA benefit, total assets, and you can own your home. Your home is not, your home is considered exempt. So the home does not count. You can have assets, but they can't exceed $150,000. And for a married couple, it's all of the assets combined. It's not just the, the, the veteran's assets. Okay, $150,000. And again, similar to what Medicaid looks at, that's checking accounts, savings accounts, IRAs, 401ks, cash value of life insurance policies, that counts, okay? All of that. Then the last piece is the cost of care element. So to access this VA benefit, and this VA benefit, even though I'm talking about it sort of right now in a sense of benefits we can apply for at home, this benefit is one that we can apply for at home, in assisted living, or in skilled nursing. So the care requirement for this benefit is that the veteran and or spouse, they're, they need to be spending more money each month on their care, not all their expenses combined, on their care. So whatever they're paying the caregiver or whatever they're paying the nursing home, or whatever they're paying the assisted living facility, they are paying more money each month on their care than what their total monthly income is. So if I'm the veteran and I'm spending $6,500 a month at assisted living, and then my spouse and I, our combined income is 4,000, I would qualify for the benefit. My care exceeds our combined income. But if the opposite was true, if I'm spending 4,000 a month on the caregiver and my wife and I's combined income from social security and some pensions is 6,500, I would not qualify. And then I'll just kind of give you a rough idea for a married couple, if I'm the vet, if, if the veteran is the one that needs care and, and they're applying for the benefit for a married couple, you're looking at about $2,600 a month. So it's a significant benefit. And the VA writes that check directly to you, and then you use that to pay for your care. So if it's a married couple um, and the veteran, the veteran is the one that needs the care, about $2,600. If it's a single veteran, okay, not married, a widow or, or widower or just you know, lifelong bachelor veteran, about 2,200 a month. And if it's the surviving spouse of a veteran, it's about 1,400 to 1,500 a month. And again, that can be accessed either paying for caregivers in the home, in, in assisted living or skilled nursing. Hey, Matt. Yes. I have a question. Uh, this is Leanne. Um, when you say about VA benefits and uh, the total healthcare expense must be greater than the total income, 
So do we need to pay, use up all of our total income toward the healthcare expense before we qualify for the benefit, for the remaining fee? Say that our income is 1000 a month and the total healthcare cost is 2000 Do we have to pay 1000 first to you qualify just, for the remaining 1000 No, you would just you would get the full benefit from the VA. Okay, so... So, as long, was, so Leanne, yeah, I, I, as I mentioned earlier, I, I, was, I was hoping that all questions would just be kind of held to the end or if you oh, could type or ask me, that's okay. Um, so let me, let me answer this, but I, let's not have any more follow-up on this just because I want to make sure I get through all the material. But in that example, if, if my wife and I's total household income is $1,000 and we're spending $2,000 a month on the caregivers, all we have to do is let the VA know that that is the case. We will, and then we will qualify for the full $2,600. So just so everybody understands and just so we're all clear, even though that would create a situation where we're getting 2,600 from the VA and we have a thousand of our own income. So technically now we've got 3,600 coming in, but we are quote unquote, only paying 2,000 towards the cost of care. That's fine. We have this $1,600 overage that we are, that we get to keep. So it's not just like the benefit from the VA will fill the gap between our income at the cost of care. As long as the cost of care I always tell clients, as long as the cost of care each month exceeds our, our total household income by $100, we're going to qualify for the full amount from the VA. The VA looks at it as like medical reimbursement. So they look at it like the fact that you're paying it out and then they're reimbursing you. And in some cases, they're reimbursing you more than what you're paying out. Plus, if you add your income to it. Um, so I hope, I hope that answered your question, Liam. Um, so really the next benefit we'll talk about um, is Medicaid, all right? And Medicaid is gonna be something that we can apply for in either a supportive living facility or a skilled nursing facility, okay? So supportive living or skilled nursing. So every single, again, I wanna be clear, as I said before, every single place that's under the umbrella of supportive living takes Medicaid. When it comes to skilled nursing facilities, some take Medicaid, some don't. All right, so it's just important to be looking at the facilities that we're looking that we're that we're maybe looking into. You can go to Medicare.gov. Medicare.gov has if you kind of do some research on that website, you can find what nursing homes take Medicaid in your general area. Um, so the way that Medicaid works is, and I'm going to talk about Medicaid. It's going to be more more. I'm going to talk about it really more in the scheme of skilled nursing. There's some some nuances for supportive living, which I'll which I'll cover after I talk about skilled nursing. So just so everybody's on the same page, the, the type of Medicaid I'm talking about right now will be um, indicative of how it works for applying for Medicaid in a skilled nursing facility, which is gonna be the more common situation that people will be in. So if I'm applying for Medicaid in a skilled nursing facility and I am a single individual, I'm allowed to have $2,000 in my name no real estate, no car, $2,000. And again, similar to what I was talking about with the VA benefit, that $2,000 is a total of my checking accounts, savings accounts, IRAs, 401ks, cash value of life insurance policies. The only thing I'm really allowed in addition to the $2,000, which we don't see that often anymore, is I can actually have 15, I can have $2,000 of, of, of assets and I can also have life insurance of up to $1,500 of face value life insurance. It's a pretty low amount. I don't really see too many clients that come in with face value policies less than that, um, but you can have up to $1,500 of face value life insurance. So just, I'd say for the most part, look at it in the sense that as a single individual, you can have $2,000. I can have, I can get to keep a whopping $30 a month of my income. So if I'm going to the nursing home and I've got $2,000 a month from social security coming in, I can, um, I can go, I, I go into the nursing home, I give them $17.70 a month, I keep $30 a month. Now, what I will say is if I've got a Medicare supplement, I can continue paying for that Medicare supplement. And it's not costing me anything, right? Because I'm either giving the nursing home $19.70 a month 
and keeping $30 if I get rid of the Medicare supplement, or let's just say the Medicare supplement costs me $300 a month, or I give Blue, Care, Blue Cross Blue Shield $300, I give the nursing home $1670 and I get to keep $30. No matter what, I only get to keep $30. So for our clients that are moving to nursing homes and applying for Medicaid, especially if they're single, we recommend keeping the Medicare supplement in place. The last thing is Medicaid has a look back period, five year look back period. What's the state looking for? Uh, well, you're all on mute, so I'm not gonna really ask anybody to give me an answer, but I'm gonna tell you, the state's looking to see if I gave any money away. They wanna look at my bank statements from the last five years. Was I writing checks to my daughter who was going through a divorce and needed help? Was I writing checks to my son who lost his job and I was helping him out? This would also be situations, guys, to kind of bring you back 15 minutes. Was I writing checks to my daughter who was my caregiver and I didn't have a, a written contract in place? So in Medicaid's eyes, I was just gifting her money. Or so forget my daughter, was I writing checks to Patricia, the caregiver, who's not a relative and I didn't have a contract with Patricia? In either one of those situations, Medicaid is gonna take the stance that I was gifting the money. And it will be an uphill battle to argue that no, this was not a gift, these were caregivers that I was paying. This is why I cannot say it enough times that if you have that private caregiver, you need to have a written contract in place. Medicaid's looking to see if you gifted any money. So I tell clients all the time, there are certain ways to gift. There are strategic ways to gift and protect assets. We're not gonna get into that today. Again, I have another talk where I discuss that. I'm forgetting, I might've done, I think, I, I think we did that earlier in the year. I'm sure it's on the YMCA's website. Uh, you'll see the title, it's like Medicaid, protecting assets, applying for Medicaid and protecting assets legally. Um, that's a great talk if you're interested in kind of looking at what you can do to protect assets, um, what options there are to protect assets and apply for Medicaid. We just won't have the time to discuss that today. So there are strategic ways to um, apply or to protect assets, but it's not gonna be like gifting your house to your daughter or starting to like gift money to your kids because you're gifting you know, under the $17,000 a year that the IRS allows you to without having to file anything with on your tax returns. That's great, the IRS allows it. Medicaid doesn't. The IRS and Medicaid don't jive, okay? So, just something to consider. And I'm looking at the time, so I'm gonna kind of kind of speed things up a little bit. Let's look at med how Medicaid works for a married couple. All right, so if I'm married and I'm applying for Medicaid, everything I just discussed is the same. I get to keep $2,000 in my name. I get to keep $30 a month of my income. And there's a five-year look back period. For my spouse, okay, so my wife in this case, my wife gets to keep the house. Doesn't matter if it's a $300,000 house or, or, or $2 million house. My wife gets to keep the house. My wife also gets to keep about $120,000. It's, it's not exact, but that's the easier number to remember. My wife gets to keep $120,000 of assets in her name, checking, savings, money market, retirement accounts, cash value of life insurance policies. I get to keep 2,000, she gets to keep 120. She gets to keep a car. She gets the house, a car, $120,000. Just so everybody knows that $120,000 just went up to 120 this year. For the last 11 years that I've been doing this, and I think for a number of years even before that, it was 109,000. So it just went up about $11,000. Um, and then lastly, from an income standpoint, you know, I get to keep $30 a month as the Medicaid recipient. My wife or my spouse gets to have $3,700 a month, 3715 to be exact, 3700 that number also just went up significantly. It went up about $1,000. For the last 10 plus years, it was at 2,700 and change. That's a significant amount. It's $12,000 more of income she gets to keep a year. What does that mean? Let me give you guys an example. And again, I wanna try to be brief. I wanna leave hopefully a couple of minutes here to answer some questions. I think after this, I won't get into the supportive living. It's a, such a small nuance with supportive living. Um, if anybody has a, a real direct question, I can I can I can send some information, um, or a real specific question, not a direct question. But so if 
from how this income works. Let's just say that my income, I'm the one going in the nursing home and my income is $2,500 a month. And my wife's income is a thousand, right? She gets a thousand from social security. I get 2,500 from social security. What I can do is I can transfer my income every month to her because my 2,500 plus her thousand puts her at 3,500, which is still less than the 3,700 that Medicaid allows her to have. So that means I can transfer her all my income. She gets to keep all the income for her own monthly expenses every month. And I don't have to give any of my income to the nursing home on a monthly basis. Now, if her income, if her income was 3,000 and mine was two, I could transfer her $700 of mine to get her up to the 3,700, but the remainder of mine, the $1,300 remainder, I could pay my Medicare supplement keep my 30 bucks and give the other thousand dollars to the nursing home. Okay. So basically I can transfer income. If I'm the, if I'm the Medicaid spouse, I can transfer income to my spouse at home up to get her or him up to the 3,700, but I can't push them over. And if my spouse is already over the 3,700, not, it's not going to happen that often, but some people were teachers or firefighters or police officers with, with large pensions. And in that situation, if my wife's income was already 4,500, I can't transfer anything to her, okay? Um, so I hope, I hope that's helpful. The last thing that I'm gonna talk about, and I'm gonna talk about this in three minutes, and then hopefully we've got, I can, I can, leave, I can answer questions until 10.15. So as long as Pam gives us until, as long as we have until 10.15 with Pam, I can answer some questions. This is sort of on topic, uh, it's enough on topic that it's that I want to bring it up because it's something I always like to bring up. It's I want to make sure everybody understands how rehab works when when we leave when somebody leaves a hospital and they go into a nursing home. Typically, go into a skilled nursing home for rehab. I need to be for for my for the rehab to be covered by Medicare, at least a portion of it. For my rehab to be covered by Medicare, I need to have three overnights in a hospital where I'm considered inpatient status. Listen, I could be in the hospital for seven nights, but they could, the hospital could say five of those nights where I was under observation, only two were inpatient. You got to ask, you have to ask these questions when your loved one is in the hospital. You have to be an advocate. Because if you have those three nights, or at least three nights, right, you could have more, but at least three nights inpatient status, and then you get discharged to a skilled nursing home for rehab, the first 20 days are covered 100% by Medicare. And then for up to an additional 80 days after that, Medicare will cover 80%. And if you have a Medicare supplement, the Medicare supplement will cover the other 20%. Now, if you have a Medicare Advantage plan, those can work a little bit differently. You have to talk to the person you bought it from. I'm not gonna go into what those options could look like, but with a Medicare Advantage plan, there's definitely gonna be more out of pocket for those remaining 80 days. Whereas with a true Medicare supplement, you could have up to hundred days with no out of pocket. Now, one thing you have to understand is that on day 35, the nursing home could have a care meeting with the family and say, hey, listen, Matt's not making any progress. He has plateaued. So in five days, he can stay here, but he's gonna be a long-term care resident. We're not giving him rehab. Medicare is not gonna cover it. And it's gonna be $350 a day privately or apply for Medicaid. Okay, just so everybody knows that. Well, we have the ability to get up to hundred days we have to be getting, we have to be making progress over those 100 days. Um, we can't, we can't just be sort of at a standstill. We can't be not making any progress at all. So I've had some clients get 23 days of rehab covered and then medic, the, the facility says, that's it. He or she's not making any progress. They got to start paying privately. But you really have to make sure you're finding out about your loved one when they're leaving the hospital to see what their status is. Were they under observation? Were they inpatient? And I would argue it's in a lot of cases, it's too late to find out when they're leaving. You want to know on a daily basis what they're being what they're being classified as. You know, was yesterday over was yesterday's stay inpatient or observation? And if they're being considered under observation, but you think they should be inpatient, there are advocates out there who understand the medical background here 
that can fight, that can help advocate for you and discuss with and, and, and fight for you with the hospital to say, you know, look at the records and say, listen, this is BS. They should have been inpatient. They should not have been under observation because listen, you can imagine the hospitals have it has, it's to their advantage. If it's, if it's a gray area, it's to their advantage to classify somebody as observation and, and not inpatient. Why? Because who do you think the hospital's biggest payer source is? Medicare. And so if everybody they're sending home from the hospital is going into rehab and then Medicare is covering the rehab because they were all classified as inpatient status, Medicare is going to start coming back to that hospital and saying, what the heck's going on here? So listen, it's one of those things where doctors are great, but there's it, it, it's a bureaucracy and it's just how it is. And it's a corporation and they need to make money. And so I'll leave it at that. But it's 10.05, I've got 10 minutes left. I wanna answer some questions. There might've been a couple of little things we didn't cover, but I would argue we, we covered most of what I wanted to. So I'm gonna start with the questions that are in the chat box. And then if I have time to answer questions on top of that, I'm happy to. Um, and again, I put my information in the chat box. If you wanna shoot me an email, you know, any questions that you think of later on, feel free. So one of the questions was, what if you get divorced to protect assets? Can the ex be a paid caregiver? So the one thing I would say is people do get divorced as a way to protect assets, because if I'm a married, you know, if I'm married and I go to apply, want to apply for Medicaid at some point down the road, Medicaid looks at all of our assets together, basically. So I would just say, you know, get advice about that. You know, not every situation where, where there's a divorce, is it going to be a slam dunk? Um, a lot of clients think, well, you know, my husband's the one that's going to get on Medicaid. We'll get divorced. You know, we'll agree that I'll take 90% of the assets and he'll get 10% and we'll be able to protect all the assets that way because he'll be a single person applying for Medicaid and he'll only have you know $50,000 and he'll spend it and get on Medicaid. But meanwhile, I get to protect $450,000. Not so fast. Medicaid has seen these things happen. Uh, they're not, you know, the state's not stupid. Um, so retain, retain an attorney, get some advice. Um, as far as can the ex be a paid caregiver? I mean, if, if they are not married anymore, that's an interesting question. You know, I, I, I would say the ex, I think the ex could be a paid caregiver. I think that you're playing with fire a little bit. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I, if, if a client was asking me that, I would say you're probably rolling the dice. Um, while it shouldn't matter because they're technically not married anymore. It kind of depends on when the, did the divorce occur like six months before you applied for Medicaid. Did the divorce occur and then Medicaid was applied for three to five years down the road? I mean, these are the these are the questions that would come up that might make that look a little that make that situation look fishy versus not fishy. So some gray area there. Good, really good questions, but I, that's not a, that's not something I could give a, a very clear answer on. Um, but really, really good questions. Um, are there any benefits available for Army reservists who were called up and served overseas? It really depends. It really depends on the discharge papers. So, um, you know, when we apply for VA benefits, this is the only benefit, just so everybody knows, this aid and attendance benefit I discussed is the only benefit through the VA that we're familiar with. There are other benefits through the VA. We just don't, we don't work with them. Um, and even with this aid and attendance benefit, we do help people apply for it. But we, I've got a colleague that comes in, he's sort of our VA benefit specialist and he works with, he works directly with all of our clients. Uh, I would say if, if anybody, is interested in figuring out whether their loved one or surviving spouse of a loved one would qualify for this aid and attendance benefit, at least just based on the service from a service standpoint. Maybe they're not, the individual's not necessarily receiving care yet, but you're interested if, you know, if the situation arises where we start needing to pay for care, do the, does the service of the veteran, will the service of the veteran qualify? Listen, I would offer it, feel free if you, if you want to email me the discharge papers, I'll send it to my colleague. He'll take a look at them and I'm happy to give you an answer. Um, so, so the person that asked that question, uh, feel free to shoot, if you, get, if you get a hold of the discharge papers, send them to me, I'm happy to, uh, to take a look and, and give you an answer. Um, it really depends because that question, I'm not really sure. Is there a reservist who are called? The reserve in general does not qualify. So it depends on if they were called up and served overseas. I mean, to me, that sounds like they, they it was active duty then. So I don't know. Um, again, I'm, I'm just not a, a veterans benefit specialist, but I'm happy to help if I can. 
Um, and if you need any help getting a hold of discharge papers, um, if, you're, if your mom or dad or brother or sister or husband or wife doesn't have them, you can shoot me an email. I can email you some, some instructions that are, I think I've been told they're a little bit outdated, but they're good enough to allow you to, to, to go online and, and, and get copies of the discharge papers. Um, so there's a question, will you please repeat the rules for Medicare coverage and the number of days in assisted living? Yeah, so this does not have anything to do with assisted living, just to be clear, okay? So what I had mentioned is to have Medicare cover rehab in a skilled nursing facility, you need three nights inpatient status in the hospital prior. If you just go from your house to a skilled nursing facility, Medicare is not covering that. For Medicare to cover, Medicare only covers what they call rehab, what, it, what they consider rehab, right? If I have a client that leaves their house and they go into a nursing home to live there long-term, they're paying privately or they're applying for Medicaid. Medicare only kicks in if I'm in a hospital, if I have some sort of medical event, I end up in the hospital, I have at least three nights in the hospital classified as inpatient status, and then I get discharged to a nursing home for rehab, then Medicare will cover the first 20 days 100%. And then for another 80 days on top of that, Medicare will cover 80%. And if I have a Medicare supplement, the Medicare supplement will pick up the other 20%. So I won't be out of pocket for potentially up to 100 days. But if I don't have a supplement or I have a Medicare Advantage plan, there will be some out of pocket. And so if you don't have a supplement, there will be out of pocket. And if you have a Advantage plan, I suggest you get some information on that Advantage plan and understand how it works in that situation and what you might be liable for out of pocket. Um, Another question, how do you find medical advocates? If you're in a situation where you need one, let me know, I'm happy to connect you with somebody. Um, I wish I could just tell you that there was like a website you could go to, but that doesn't really exist. So if, you, if you're looking for an advocate to help in these situations, um, listen, and, and the one thing I'll offer to everybody here, if you have a need for anybody that you think, you know, I, I don't care if you have the need for another lawyer that has nothing to do with elder law, you need a, I don't know, a divorce lawyer, a personal injury lawyer, a real estate lawyer, or you need any people that can help you think with any kind of long, with any kind of elder law issue, even if you don't think I do it, you can always shoot me an email. Chances are I've got somebody that I know well that I can connect you with that I trust. And if I don't, I'll do my best to help find somebody for you through a trusted colleague. Okay. So that offer is out there for everybody. Um, so, so Kathy, to your question, happy to help if that's the case, just shoot me an email, uh, you know, if, and when you're in need, uh, let's see. All right. So I saw another less last, last question or not last question, Eugenia, best way to access this and previous talks. I'll let Pam chime in at the end. She can kind of, or Pam, go ahead right now. It's on no, the website. I'll let you finish. Cause I know okay. you got to get off at 10 15. I'll do that. Okay. Again. Okay. So Pam, I'll let Pam answer how to access the, this talk and previous ones, um, other helpful websites on this topic. I wish I could tell you. Um, there, there, there's nowhere, unfortunately, Eugenia, there's nowhere I could direct you to specifically that will give you this information. Um, I wish, I wish, I wish I could. Um, it's just not, it's not necessarily something that is. You could Google it, but I mean, if you Google, you know, navigating the long-term care maze, you're not, you're going to get a bunch of stuff that's probably not even relevant. Um, I would say, if you know, watch this video again, you could watch some of the other, I'd recommend watching some of the other videos of talks that I've given. There's a, there's a lot of, uh, sort of cross pollination, if you will, with the talks I give. Um, and I think if you, if you, you know, if you have the time and you want to get some information, um, I think there's a lot of valuable information that, that I provide in these talks, not to toot my own horn. I mean, these are things that are important to people. And we do them every day. And so for us, it's, it's you know, uh, it's just common knowledge, but for most people, it's not, right? For all of you, you probably, you probably heard at least one thing today that you've never heard before. At least I hope so. Um, or maybe I hope you don't, maybe I hope that's not the case, right? I hope everybody do all this before and I'm just re reiterating it, but I know that's not the case. So, um, you know, I'd advise you to watch some of these videos. And, and at the end of the day, if you have a, you know, obviously, listen, again, this isn't why I do it, but if you have a, have a need at some point to sit down and ask some questions, 
you know, we charge a fee, but I'm happy to help you with it. If, if, if there's a situation that arises where you, where you need the help, obviously, I mean, this, this is what we do. So um, I think I got through all the questions. It's 1014. I suppose Thank if somebody you. has a quick question, I can answer a very quick question in like one minute. I think I think everyone put them in the chat. So yeah. thank you so yeah, much. Matt. I'll talk yeah. to the group. Thank you so much. Um, Matt will be back next month, Wednesday, May 3rd, for tips and tricks for the child caregiver. Um, so I encourage you. Um, we'll offer planning strategies and important matters to consider for adult children when they realize they will be taking care of their aging parents. So next month, May 3rd, and we'll I, also be here. And I would say on top of that, I would say that 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 will be a, a, a shorter talk, a shorter discussion, and that will lead itself, lend itself to more, more questions. So I would also say that if there are anybody on here that is caring for a parent or, you know, um, you know, come with, come with questions and I'm happy to answer them. So, um, all right, I'm gonna get going. Pam, thank you so much. Um, I appreciate everybody spending the time with us this morning. Really great turnout. And uh, for those of you that I see next month, great. Have a great day. Bye. Bye. Again. Hi, Matt. So again, that is also listed on our website. Our next talk is tomorrow about acupuncture. Demystifying acupuncture is tomorrow at 10 a.m. Um, with uh, a new speaker with Al Ladis. Uh, I'll get his name tomorrow, right? Ladistic. And um, yeah, we hope to see you. Matt again is next May 3rd. And you can find our information online. If you go on our website, nsymca.org, and then you do the backslash with YS or just search for y, the YS program, the y, YMCA education program, um, you will find some a box that'll say um, podcasts or videos. Click that and then you'll find our YouTube site has all of Matt's old talks. Um, I've heard this talk maybe like three or four times, maybe five times at this time, and I'm always paying attention and hearing new things I didn't before. So I would encourage you, this talk will get posted later on today. And then you can also see, like he did this talk like maybe six months ago too. So maybe there's different information that he had there. Anyway, um, thank you very much for um, coming. I hope to see you at least next month, if not tomorrow. Bye y'all. Thank you.